Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to start by saying thank you all for, for joining us, and I hope that this conversation, which is what we're hoping to have with Adriana Cisneros, will help to enlighten and inform a little bit about what are the plans for the Cisneros Group of Companies, and uh, some of the great impressions and views that Adriana Cisneros has about the world we are living in and the media age that we are fortunate enough to be able to work in. And so, with that said, uh, Adriana is the uh, Director of Strategy and the Vice Chairman of Cisneros Group. It's a private media, entertainment, telecom, and consultant uh, consumer products conglomerate founded in 1929. And I don't need to explain what the Cisneros Group is to this room, but clearly, I think that there are other aspects of what Adriana has been doing that are very important. In addition to running the Fundación Cisneros, uh, which has been focusing on a global awareness of Latin American issues, art, culture, and as well as education. Um, she was named the successor to her father in 2009, and since then she has been really shaping a new multi-screen approach to the media business with the growth in digital, uh, interactive strategies, and new ventures, uh, the projects that they're doing in, in China with CCTV, and also uh, really the exploration of growth in the English language market for Latinos in the United States. She's really stated that her, dream, her drive comes from a nurturing that was found in her home when she was growing up. And what I loved to read about her was that she considered her father her thinking partner. And from someone who had that kind of relationship with my own father, and, and I'm looking at Bruce who has that relationship with his daughter, I think that's, there's nothing better than that kind of connection with your, with your child or with your parent. And to have a thinking partner is a real benefit. And clearly, I think that we're in a time when Latin America is growing, when we really have an incredible opportunity with US Hispanics, where the, uh, the, the reality is that the next president will likely be decided by the Latino vote in the United States, and where it's really refreshing to know that one of the great Latin companies with such a long uh, trajectory is being run by a third generation Cisneros, and to that, a woman. Please welcome Adriana Cisneros. Gracias, Cynthia. So we wanted to do a format that would not be the, trip, the traditional speech. And so we have some questions, and, and I, I hope I don't scare you with some of them. But I guess the first one we want to kind of get out of the way is that there were huge elections that we at CNN in Espanol were covering on Sunday. And uh, Hugo Chavez has now been reelected for a new term for six more years. What's your take on that? And tell us a little bit about the impression that this is um, causing for well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on the outcome. I think it's fairly obvious to most of you um, what we would have liked to happen. Um, I will comment on the process. Um, the process was an absolute success. We had more than 82% participation in the elections. 50% of the people vote in the U.S., so 82% is enormous. Um, it means that 14 years later, people are motivated, want to participate, want to be part of the democratic process. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with the coming of age of the middle class that we're seeing in all of Latin America, not just in Venezuela. Um, so democracy is in place. Change will come in its, in its due time. Um, and, and people are involved. I think from the media perspective, um, we actually dedicated the coverage 24 hours uh, of the day to the elections at Venevision. Uh, we also had a live YouTube channel and we streamed for 20 hours straight. Um, and we were able to do, I think, uh, from the professional standpoint, from the news standpoint, um, a format that had never been done in our country and has really become the men benchmark of how we cover the news. Now, being a third generation Cisneros and, and, and dealing with very, you know, traditionally male dominant universe that we live in in Latin America, uh, how does that inform your experience and decision making and your vision for Cisneros Group? What, what is it that brings, what is it that you're bringing to the table that changes some of the traditional uh, roles uh, that, have, that have played in the, in, the, in the region? Well, I think Latin America is dominated by women. Um, <laughs> no, you know, I often get asked the gender question, you know, the woman issue in, in my case has never been an issue. Um, I was, first of all, I was raised in a household where all of us were, were my father had the same uh, expectations of all of his kids. 
uh, brother, sister, and myself. Um, I also have an extraordinary mother uh, who has worked extremely hard um, every day. Um, and I see in my parents a relationship where my father would have not been successful without my mother's support, and my mother would have not been successful without my father pushing her. Um, so that's a type of household um, where I was born. I also grew up in a Venezuela that um, um, had the highest rate of female CEOs per capita uh, in Latin America. So, you know, that's the environment where I grew up. I think maybe perhaps the experience of a, of a female executive might have been different in Argentina or Chile or, or Brazil. I, I don't have that data. But the woman issue was never an issue for us. Now, um, clearly, I think we're, we're heading into a multi-screen universe. And you led the development of the digital strategy for Evaluna. And it was really the first telenovela to incorporate digital from the concept. Tell us a little bit about that experience and your digital plans. Yeah, so I, I like to say, people often ask me about Evaluna, that, that Evaluna was our coming out digital party in the US. Um, and I say in the US because we launched our digital thinking and strategy and new way of producing in Venezuela. Uh, for three years before Evaluna came, we gave a mandate to go fully digital um, from the get-go, from the moment that we were thinking about an idea in Venezuela. It was easy for us to do it there because we control the full cycle of the ecosystem where we work. Uh, we have a network, we have a distribution business, we, we, have, uh, we m m have all the information that we need in terms of ratings and outreach, etc. Um, so it was very easy for us to experiment there. And over the course of three years, we went from not having um, a digital strategy to really starting to create products that from the beginning were being created with the digital thinking as part of the script. The, writer, the writers that we were hiring had to have that digital knowledge in them. Um, and three years in, we were finally ready. And we took all of that know-how from Venezuela and we applied it to Evaluna, which was the first soap in the US for the US Hispanic market that had a digital platform behind it. The results were extraordinary. Um, Evaluna, we kept beating uh, open American networks at prime time, which means that there were more people watching my soap in Spanish in the US than people watching NBC and CBS. That's extraordinary. Um, and there were two million new viewers that came out of nowhere. And when we compare the data between our outputs and inputs on the digital aspect and the ratings, we realized that we ha what we had done is that we had made the soap genre attractive to the younger, a younger demo because there were so many digital applications to the soap that the younger people felt engaged. And it wasn't just creating we you know, webisodes or whatever. It was actually making the characters in the soap have digital personalities. And that was what made it different. And that's now become the industry standard. Now, talking about digital, I think that uh, you guys recently uh, announced the, the purchase of Contextua, and I believe that you're either about to announce or have announced another uh, uh, foray into finding a way to go from the, the kind of evasive and elusive digital dollars and, you know, digital dimes and, and TV dollars. And so tell us a little bit about that strategy. Sure. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we launched a company called Redmas which is a digital advertising network um, or, uh, to begin with for the U.S. Hispanic market, but now includes all of Latin America. You know, we have 33 channels on YouTube. Uh, we deal with a lot of traffic, both in the U.S. and Latin America online. And we saw that um, the Hispanic traffic was not being managed correctly. There were larger agencies that have that service, but they literally had the guy in the corner who was in charge of people that kind of spoke Spanish, I suppose. And we thought there was a great opportunity to do, to do something about it. Um, the digital um, advertising market in Latin America uh, is already at $4 billion uh, market, and it's growing at 20% a year. That's a very large increment. So from Redmas, we bought Contextua, um, and we're about to announce the acquisition of another company that has made us overnight into the leading advertising digital network for the US Hispanic in English and in Spanish and for Latin America. So we're at that intersection between social media, and you talked about having personas, you know, personalities having their own uh, website and, and digital uh, attitude that complemented your soap operas. Um, and you invested in digital studios. How are those challenges that are being faced by traditional screens going to be met in this new kind of multi-screen digital environment? And kind of can you give us an idea of what's the next step after Evaluna and all of this? Where are we headed? 
you know, part of the, the, the magic of our group, uh, and perhaps also where the challenge comes, is that we really want, and, we, and we've been doing it for some 30 years now, we want to be able to deliver um, to the entire continent. So it's the U.S. Hispanic plus Latin America. Uh, the reality in the digital world um, is that um, the digital world in the U.S. is much more mature than it is in Latin America. In Latin America, we're doing extremely well in terms of traffic and volume um, and the stuff that's being produced. But the dollars are coming from the U.S. They're not quite in Latin America yet. They're about to be there. Um, so when we think about producing content for the digital world that has nothing to do with the TV screen, this is from our digital studios, content that is created, um, and it's to be consumed on a screen that's not a TV screen, um, you can make the argument for that to be a proper business in the United States. Uh, the ad revenue is there, uh, and these are conversations that I often have with my pals at YouTube and, and Google and everybody else. When you get to Latin America, we're still not quite there. So, for example, in Latin America, if you were working on that model alone, it's very difficult to justify uh, an online program that you want to do that's going to cost you eight, nine, fifteen thousand dollars an episode to film a nine minute, ten minute segment. It's very difficult to make that money back in Latin America. However, uh, we are the, of the belief, and it's something that we've always done, that if you are the leader in the industry, it is your job to be there, to make it work, to educate the, advertise, the advertisers um, until the time arrives where you can start making money. You can't take the back seat until the ecosystem changes. You want to be the first out of the gate. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what you've mentioned already, which is the English language for U.S. Hispanics. And there's been a lot of talk recently in the industry about the Univision and uh, uh, ABC deal. Uh, tell us a little bit about the strategy there, because that's a, that's a change, that's a game changer. Yeah, you know, people like to say, well, you know, what is it? You know, is it Spanish? Is it English? Is it Spanglish? The only thing I know is that it's not Spanglish. Spanglish is a very difficult formula to figure out because everybody has a very different way of speaking Spanglish. Um, what I do know is that m me, myself, as a Hispanic living in New York, sometimes I like to watch content in Spanish, and sometimes I like to watch content in English, and that's okay. And that's the way that we think about it. We're not trying to cubbyhole people. We're trying to really cater to our viewers at every stage of their development. It could be their development could be during the day, where, what mood they're in. It could also be a lifetime development. Um, and I think the English language uh, market, it's, it's somewhere where we have to be. Um, we're looking at some interesting opportunities. Uh, hopefully we'll be making an announcement soon. But it looks like we will be able to um, have about 80 million subs in the cable world watching content in English with our flag. So, Awesome. So let's go back to Latin America a little bit, because I think that we're looking at these 27, 27 million new people entering the middle class. These are digital natives. These are people who are younger. And you know, how does the region, and I, now I talk about not only your company, but all the other companies, including companies from the U.S. who want to try to do investments in the region. How do media companies deal with this new emerging digital native middle class? Yeah. So, you know, Latin America's era has arrived. This really is our decade. Um, it's, it's very exciting uh, to be able to say that. Um, we are focusing, and I think perhaps the reason this lunch is, even, is happening is because the um, the market has, has grown exponentially. Just at this, at this uh, fair, at MIPCOM, uh, Latin American uh, participation has grown by 36%. Um, the great story in Latin America is that by 2020, 43% of the continent is gonna be part of the middle class. That is a very different story from where we were 10 years ago. And this middle class is coming of age during the digital age. So from the purely business standpoint, I'm very, very much focused on that sweet spot. What does it mean to have all these 27 million people every year joining a middle class who are digitally native, who all have cell phones, who will all, ha who 60 percent of them will have a smartphone uh, in a matter of two or three years? How is that changing the way that they consume media, the way that they interact with their world? You you can even think about banking services and the access that they have to capital and the fact that they want to do everything through their cell phones. Um, it's very interesting, but we have to be careful. We have to make sure that we give the middle class all the tools that they need to be able to fulfill 
their dream and to be part of the society. We have to insist that education gets better and better in our countries, uh, that it's more accessible, of better quality, and in the right um, materias, in the right subjects. We need programmers, we need engineers, uh, we need people that will focus on infrastructure. So speaking of that middle class, and I think this is a great kind of uh, continued conversation, um, you know, we talk about what they're looking for in entertainment and, and how do we customize and create for this new audience. What kinds of things are they looking for? What are the specific needs of this new group that are different from 15, 20 years ago? Is it the storyline? Is it in addition to the storyline, additional types of screen content that you're giving them, accompanying uh, the, the, the original content? What happens to this new dynamic? Um, I think it's a little bit of everything, uh, but it has to start with the understanding that this new emerging middle class has access to technology. They are worldly, they are cultured. Um, because of the YouTube phenomena, they also know what everybody else in the world is watching. And they wanna be a part of that conversation. Um, we have to continue raising the standards of everything that we produce. Not in just in terms of quality, but also in terms of the themes, the formats, the subjects that we're, that we're treating. Um, it's a really neat opportunity for us to do that, but we have to be very disciplined about always trying to respond to global trends and bringing them home. So we're talking, we're talking about education, and I know that you all have Classe, which is a, a channel that was created a few years ago for uh, children and, and, and helping in that area. And you're also a mentor in Brazil for an interesting initiative called 21212. And that is particularly interesting to me because it's really paved the way for emerging players in the digital space. Tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, as you mentioned in, in your very kind intro, um, I also, I'm also the president of our, our foundation, which is a family foundation. And for the first 35 years, uh, the foundation was 100% committed to education. Um, and now, on top of the educational part of giving access to education, uh, we're beginning to be focused on entrepreneurship. I think from, you know, the next step from education is on entrepreneurship, and we have to push for that to also happen. One of the ways that we're doing this is by um, supporting uh, incubators in Latin America. And there's two incubators that are really doing an extraordinary job. One is called 21212 out of Brazil, and the other one is NextTP Labs out of Argentina, uh, which deals with more like Spanish language startups, I would say. Between those two, you have the two incubators that are really responsible for the startup revolution in Latin America. Um, I, I'm an investor, but I'm also a mentor. Uh, and by being a mentor, it means that from each incubator, I get three companies assigned or three startups assigned for each cycle. And there's two or three cycles a year. Um, I work with teams of young kids that, that really want to make it and want to have a new way and a new proposal of how they want to work their businesses. And I think our responsibility um, as success successful business people is to give them a hand and to show them the rope so that they can be uh, part of this new economy that we're all hoping to, to grow. So continuing on that line, I know that corporate social responsibility has really become an interesting theme in Latin America in recent years. And in fact, for the first time, there was a social responsibility uh, element in the recent uh, meetings in Cartagena. Uh, this past year. Yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit about what it means with, when you have, you know, the U.S., of course, the largest donor in the world. There, there are 20, more than 22,000 NGOs in the United States. But in Latin America, there's only 1,500. There's a stark contrast. Um, what has to happen? What is the role of the governments and the policies and the, the companies that have to work in this field and in these regions to be able to improve the, the corporate social responsibility across the region? Yeah, so you know, I think you know, the, the way I see it, doing good is good for business. Uh, and that just has, that's part of my daily mantra. I wake up and I, I know that doing good is good for business. And we like doing good. Uh, we no longer have you know, separate chapters in our corporate brochures that speak about corporate social responsibility because corporate social responsibility is a part of our daily life and of our daily operations and the way that we run our companies. The NGO part is a little bit more complicated. Um, I believe that it's a responsibility of the private sector to
to demand and to work very closely with their governments so that they change the incentives so that there's benefits in giving back to society. In most countries in Latin America, that is not the case. There are no tax exemptions. There is nothing to motivate a private citizen to be a philanthropic, to give back to the community, other than doing it out of personal conviction. And that is the, that's the main difference between that ecosystem in the US and that ecosystem in Latin America. So when we talk about these uh, uh, corporate responsibilities that, the, that, that need to come from a private sector, and we're dealing with a very interesting dynamic in Latin America with regards to the way that governments are changing their position. Uh, and, and you have a really interesting kind of wave that we're riding. Where does that, where does that corporate and uh, government partnership really come to fruition? When do you see it? Where, where are you seeing those opportunities happen? Yeah, I think the, the, the shining star, I would say, in this topic has to be Colombia. Uh, what Colombia has done to really integrate, uh, is anybody here from Colombia? Uh, I think what, what Colombia has done to really encourage the private sector to work with the public sector is extraordinary. Um, I believe that was a fundamental piece of the equation for them to be able to rebuild their country after so many decades of hardship. Um, I pay a lot of attention to the way that they're doing it. I actually go to philanthropic forums in Colombia all the time so that I can learn about how these partnerships work. It's not easy. You have to be very patient. Uh, but I think um, it's part of our responsibility to do it. Um, I think gone are the, day, gone are the, are the days of, of setting um, foundations or philanthropic endeavors that are not in partnership with the communities uh, and with the governments. I think it's our responsibility to really show the government um, the muscle that we have to get things done and to work together. So as the last question, so we can get on with our lunch and, and thanking you so much for your time. Um, I guess the, the, big, the big issue that we're all facing now is how we continue to build our businesses in this multiple screen with an emerging middle class. If you summed it all up, if you said, here's the biggest challenge, is it all of it? Or can you think of one thing that's going to be the driver for you in terms of the next five years? Well, I think if you speak Spanish, you can go for world domination. 